Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast is your one-stop shop for fantasy football news and advice. Can't decide on who to draft on the first round? Going gaga on how to line up your team. Got you covered. Traditional leagues, dynasty leagues, PPR leagues, IDP leagues, IDP leagues, even daily fantasy football leagues. Join us as we break down all the questions of fantasy football. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. Welcome in to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. I am your host, BSP, Brandon Soderpenner. Got an absolutely packed show for you guys today. Want to start off by saying I am sorry that I missed the last episode here. Had a family emergency had to attend to, but needless to say, I'm back. We've got plenty of content because of that. As always, going to kick you off with our five burning questions for today's episode. Then we've got the wide receiver preview for the NFC and AFC East. A lot to unpack there. And I'm going to round everything off today with my top 10 fantasy prospects under the age of 25. Last week, I took a look at all the prospects over 30. Now we're going to get into some of the young players and really break them down as to who's going to give you the best shot to really win your league for you this year. One other quick side note before we really get going. I know I brought up a couple times that I have started brewing my own beer, trying that out, and today is bottling day. So, unfortunately, it doesn't mean you can just bottle it, refrigerate it, and you're done. Still got a couple weeks left, you bottle it, the beer carbonates, and then after a couple weeks, you can get it cold and finally, you know, try out the product. So, excited about that. Let you know how that goes. This is not something I've ever done before, so uh, everything's an experiment. But anyway, so today, guys, before I start diving into the fantasy stuff. I for the first time since all of this has started, I am legitimately starting to worry about football being played this year. Especially on the college level. It just seems like there's a a lot of logistics and things that are going to be really tough to get over. A lot of conferences have already canceled their fall sports. Would not be surprised if you start seeing, you know, the bigger conferences start to tumble and then once one goes, once you see the Big 12, The Pac-12, the Big Ten, one of those guys canceled their sports. Everyone else is going to end up following suit. So that worries me. Just the nature of the sport, the amount of contact that you're going to have between players, the amount of players that you have on the field. We're talking 22 guys on the field at any given time. And hundreds of people that are involved in making a game happen from week to week. There doesn't seem to be a ton of progress between the NFLPA and the NFL in developing guidelines that are going to be safe for everyone. It really feels like the owners thought when everything was happening a few months ago that we'd be in a very different place at this point, and we're just not. So as tough as it is to think about, this is something that we may be staring down. We may not have an NFL season this year. Baseball finally got started a couple nights ago now. That was really good to see. Baseball is a different kind of sport. You can socially distance that easily. Uh, Same thing with basketball, with the whole bubble concept that was genius, right? Of course, there's still a chance that people are going to get corona, but their last batch of tests, nobody came back positive because everyone in the bubble does not have it. So uh, kudos to the NBA for being able to do that. I understand why the NFL wouldn't be able to because of their scale, but it's just going to lead to a lot more exposure risk. So that really worries me, guys. Now, even if football is played, there's a couple things that we now are going to be dealing with as well. As I predicted, uh, the NFL has finally agreed to just not have any preseason games this year. That also means no joint practices, and even more importantly, I think, that means no training camp for referees as well. 
So you're going to see younger players struggle. You're going to see players that are moving into a new system struggle because now they're not going to have any live game action until week one. There's only so much that you can simulate in practice with your own team. Now, with the officials, this is terrifying to me. I didn't know this until I really started to dive in more, but they usually send officials to four or five days of training camp just to at least kind of try to get acclimated themselves. So that's gone now. Same thing with referees. Live action is completely different than watching film, guys. It's going to be a mess at the beginning of the year. It's going to look a lot like when we had replacement referees a few years ago. So that's terrifying. Now, from a fantasy perspective, what you have to look at is teams with a lot of younger players, rookies, and teams with new coaching staffs, because that's going to be affected as well. The, the example that I go to is with my own team, the Cleveland Browns. Kevin Stefanski, first-year head coach, obviously his first year with the team, he's not going to have any time to get these guys in live game action. And guess what? Week one, they go on the road to play the Baltimore Ravens, a team that has had the same coach for what feels like eons, and an established team. They've got an offensive line that's pretty much stayed the same. That's another piece of it that I think people don't consider is how offensive lines are going to have to mesh together. The Browns have two new offensive linemen, one of which they drafted, and then, of course, Jack Conklin that they got out of free agency. So that's going to be a mess as well. It's going to just produce some very sloppy football for the first few weeks. So from a viewership standpoint, you got to be ready for that. And then just be careful from a fantasy standpoint. I've made the point a couple of times that you've just got to be careful with people in new systems because now they're going to have no time to prepare whatsoever going into the 2020 season. So I'm still hopeful we're going to have football. However, man, it's it's getting scary at this point. But regardless, I'm going to continue on with this podcast, give you all the, the fantasy information you need because I'm just going to go ahead and assume that we're still going to be playing football here in the fall. So... If we're going to have football, that means we're going to have fantasy football, and that means you guys are going to need some strategy. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start with the five burning questions of today's episode. Remember, guys, we are always open to your questions. I would love to be able to get into some specifics with you all. You can uh, submit your question through a couple of our Twitter pages. You can tweet the show directly at GSMC underscore F football. And then, of course, you can get my personal Twitter. That is at LaMachine17, L-A Machine 17. Taking any of your fantasy questions and any off-the-wall questions you have, always like to round it off with uh, a little bit of a different question that may not necessarily be fantasy-related. But let's go ahead and dive into it, guys. So number one, if you've been listening to this podcast, you should know my answer pretty much right away. And that is, is the zero running back strategy viable in 2020? Now, for those not familiar, there has been this trend the last few years with fantasy experts to go in with a zero running back approach where you address every other part of your team first. You're going to go for an elite wide receiver, an elite tight end, and round off all those areas. And then the idea is to grab running backs much later who have upside or guys who have, you know, carved out roles in their offenses already that may not be lead guys. So like a Tariq Cohen or James White, someone who you know is going to get you consistent value that may not, you know, blow the roof off every week. So I understand this. Like I said, it's been a popular strategy lately, but this does not really seem like the year to do it. Guys, the running back position dries up very quickly. Once you get outside the top 10, you have a few players that you're taking a legitimate risk on. You're you're talking about a Todd Gurley, an Austin Eckler, a Miles Sanders, guys that we don't know exactly how they're going to perform this year. At least I'm not completely high on them. Wide receivers, you can get value late. There are wide receivers all over the place. As the NFL continues to shift towards a more pass-happy league, you're going to have receivers, second, even third receivers, that are still getting volume, whereas the running back position, as it's moving the other direction, there's only so many of those guys that you're going to be able to rely on week in and week out. So I don't get it for this year. Other drafts, maybe. Other years, I could see why you'd want to do this, but there is just not enough value at the running back position for you to be trying that this year, especially when you're going to be able to get some solid wide receivers very late. I mean, yeah, you might miss out on Julio. You might miss out on Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, if you like him. 
but there are plenty of receivers with real breakout potential and that are going to get fed quite a bit. Like Cincinnati, who I talked about, will come up a little bit later. You've got potentially four guys on there that can produce for you, but there's only one Joe Mixon on that team and nobody else. So not a fan of the zero running back strategy in 2020. Speaking on that, I'm going to roll it right into number two here, and that is should you go into a draft with a strict positional order? Now, when I first started playing fantasy football, this was something that I did quite a bit. I would take a look at my rankings, and then I would try to order myself out exactly how I wanted to attack each position. So I'd put, you know, running back round one, running back round two, wide receiver round three, tight end round four. Like, I would try to script it. And part of that was just to make sure that I got all the players that I needed, and then also to make sure that I was emphasizing the correct positions as the draft went along. And I've realized more and more now, guys, that's not something you should really be doing. While I am big on the running backs this year, you have to play it based on how the draft is coming towards you. You have to assume worst case scenario, and you cannot be rigid with your draft strategy. So let's say I have the ninth pick, right, in a 12-team league. Of course I want to go running back, but the first eight picks are running backs, guys. They're all running backs. And then Michael Thomas is staring you in the face at number eight. You're taking Michael Thomas, guys, or Julio Jones, or somebody in that realm. You have to take your best player available and let the draft, you know, come to you. Don't solely set your sights on one position group for each round, and then don't get completely caught into one player that you want. There are going to be guys that go earlier than you expect. There are going to be pl other fantasy players that are higher on these guys than you realize. So just make sure that you are ready to make the diff difficult decision. And the best piece of advice there I could give you is just assume the worst. Plan for the worst case scenario. Plan that every one of your guys in your rankings are gone up to that point. If you have pick 10, act like your top nine guys are going to be off the board. So be ready for that. Don't reach for position. You can do that a little bit with running back in the mid rounds because like I said, it's going to dry up quickly, but don't set your sights on one specific position every time. So enough of draft advice. Going to move on to something a little bit different here now. Question number three is, are there any 2021 prospects that you are looking forward to in fantasy? Like I said, we might not get to see these guys on the field this year, but there are a lot of exciting players coming out of the 2021 draft that I think might have immediate fantasy value starting next year. And if not next year, they're going to be incredible players moving forward. So I picked out three specifically that I'm excited for. So everyone's talking about Trevor Lawrence, and yes, he's going to tear the league up. I'm completely convinced of that. However, from an excitement standpoint, guys, Justin Fields out of Ohio State is going to be a lot of fun to watch. He has amazing ability with his feet. He's a very accurate quarterback as well. So he's going to be a true dual threat in the NFL. If he can play smart and go down quick and get out of bounds like Lamar Jackson has gotten so good at doing, he's going to be an electric player that, even if he's not a better quarterback than Trevor Lawrence— could outproduce him from a fantasy perspective. I mean, we see this a little bit even with Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. I don't think anyone's going to argue that Lamar Jackson's the better quarterback, but he has the threat as, of finishing as the number one every week because he has that strong dual threat ability. I don't see the same kind of speed in Justin Fields, but he's a smart player, he's an accurate player, and he is going to make an incredible NFL quarterback. I think he's going to start right away, barring you know an injury or something else crazy happening to him. Another guy that I'm really interested in, his name hasn't started popping up a lot because of his size, I believe, but he will be a true NFL workhorse. That's Rondell Moore, guys. He's a wide receiver out of Purdue, and the reason you might not have heard of him to this point, like I mentioned, is he's 5'9", 181 pounds. Now, he, this dude is built like a freaking tank still, right? He's small. But the way he plays the wide receiver position, he's just going to destroy you physically, guys. He is a ridiculously fast bowling ball. He's going to be a slot option because of his size. We know that. But when he has the ball in his hands, he has amazing rack ability. He's able to make guys miss. It's like a running back out of the backfield, right, that can catch the ball, but has a wide receiver vertical. He is a physical freak that is still learning 
all of the aspects of the position, which I think he'll round out this year. He has some issues with some concentration drops and things like that, but I believe that will shore up. And by the time he gets into the NFL, he's going to be a target vacuum. He's going to be a slot receiver that is always going to be able to create separation and get open. And once he has the ball in his hands, he is a threat to take it to the house. So keep an eye on Rondale Moore. He's moving up people's draft boards at this point, and wherever he ends up, like I said, he'll be a target vacuum, and I think he'll be a fantasy option right away. I like him a lot. And then the last one, guys, who I believe is the best running back in college football right now, that's Travis Etienne. This dude is incredible. This guy is the definition of speed. Not only are we talking about that second, third gear where you just take off down the field, he's got burst and acceleration as well. He already has pretty much everything you want from an NFL running back. He's going to be able to absorb hits, and he's not going to take a lot of them because the guy is just shifty, and like I said, he's fast. I said more reminded me of a wide receiver with a running back build, and Travis Etienne is a running back with all of the wide receiver ability as well. He's going to be able to factor into your passing game, which where the league is currently starting to shift right now is going to be incredibly valuable. So keep an eye on Travis Etienne. Again, assuming we have a season this year, he should be a first-round pick. He has first-round talent, and the only thing that could keep him from not attaining that is just the devaluing of running backs in the league. But like I said, he's got true pass-catching ability down there as well. So that's going to—teams are going to look at that and immediately try to latch on to him. So look for Travis Etienne, probably more than anyone else, to have the quickest fantasy impact as he really has top 15 running back potential even in his first year in the league. All right, so question number four. This was something that I really started to think about as I'm listening to to other fantasy experts and podcasts and things like that, and it caught me off guard at first. Like, there's, there's literally no way was my first reaction to the question. But it's, can every Bengals skill player outperform their ADP? Now, I'm not talking about Giovanni Bernard. We're not talking about kickers, defense, nothing, none of that. Just their main skill players. And the more I look into it, I actually buy it, guys. So we'll start at the very top. So Joe Mixon, you guys know my opinion on him. He's running back seven right now on most boards. I think he's going to finish as a top five guy. So he's outperforming his ADP right off the bat. He's going to be a workhorse. He's got a better quarterback in front of him now. There's really no reason he shouldn't be able to outperform that. A.J. Green, their number one wide receiver sitting at wide receiver 28. I am surprised that he has not moved up boards more. He's moved up a couple of spots, but... Not enough to really move the needle at this point. When Green is healthy and on the field, he puts up wide receiver one numbers, and there's no reason to think that he's not going to be on the field for at least the majority of the year. Even if he misses a game or two, I would not be surprised to see Green finish somewhere in the wide receiver 14 to 16 range, way higher than where he's at at 28 right now. Same thing with Tyler Boyd. Boyd had an excellent season last year, and... For some reason, people think that A.J. Green coming back is going to completely take away from that. There's going to be more targets this year. You've got a more talented quarterback. You have a bad defense. They're going to be throwing the ball a lot. And Tyler Boyd is a solid number two option there to A.J. Green. So 32? No, he's going to outperform that. He's going to be somewhere in the mid-20s. John Ross talked about him a little bit. He's wide receiver 74 right now, which I understand because he's been burning people for years uh, the people were very excited about John Ross because of his speed, but what I don't think a lot of fantasy owners realized is it didn't have nearly as much to do with Ross as it did with his quarterback. There were times where Ross was just completely missed down the field by Andy Dalton because he didn't have the arm to get it to him. He didn't have the talent to get Ross the ball where he's able to get open. Ross is not a guy that's going to get open on these short intermediate routes. He is a burner, and you have to be able to hit him down the field, and Joe Burrow is definitely going to be able to do that. So wide receiver 74, I think he could blow that out of the water and be a solid wide receiver 3. T. Higgins, he's wide receiver 77. I think they drafted him to be the replacement for A.J. Green. They're going to find ways to work him into the offense, and I don't think he's going to be a regular starter right away. However, there, like I said, there's targets to go around in this offense. There's only one running back that you have to worry about as far as taking touches and uh, scoring opportunities away. So T. Higgins, another guy 
<laughs> wide receiver 77, ADPs all the way up in the 200s. Someone that you can stash and I think will have production towards the end of the year. So he could definitely outperform 77. Guys, even CJ, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, Uzeman, they're tight end. He's tight end 39 right now. His ADP is not even available because he's not getting drafted. And I, I get that. He's not an ideal tight end. But if you just want to fly somebody at the end of your draft, he beat out Tyler Eifert last year when Tyler Eifert didn't miss a single game. He's not going to be utilized a ton because there are a lot of good receiving options in front of him, but he will be on the field and there is inherent value with that. So to be a start, a, a legitimate number one tight end for his team and to be at tight end 39 is ludicrous. I'm not betting on him to be a top 20 guy, but he will still have value. And the fact that his ADP is non-existent means that he's going to be able to easily outproduce that as well. So as nuts as it sounds, Every Bengals player can actually outperform their ADP in 2020. It's crazy to think about. I'm willing to bet on that, though. I like this offense a ton. They're going to be on the field a ton. Like I said, that defense is not great. The only thing that this is all hinging on is Joe Burrow. If Burrow busts, none of this will happen. But I don't think he will. The dude looks polished. He's NFL ready. He was a a four-year player in college. And I'm just I'm excited to see what he's going to be able to do with all of these weapons around him. And that's another guy I forgot to put on the list. Joe Burrow. He's sitting there at quarterback 20 with guys like Ryan Tannehill, Baker Mayfield, Kirk Cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo. These are all players I could realistically see Joe Burrow finishing with better fantasy numbers than 20 is a very easy spot for him to climb out of. So Joe Burrow, Mixon, Green, Boyd, Ross, Higgins, even Uzaman. I'm. Please let me know if I'm pronouncing that wrong. All of these guys in this very potent offense are somehow being underrated and are all going to be able to perform their ADP, outperform their ADP when all is said and done. So that is the four fantasy questions for today. Uh, In honor of baseball season starting up, guys, I wanted to give just my quick and MLB season predictions here for my fifth question. Who's going to be in the playoffs and who is going to win it all? So on the American League side, my division winners, I've got the Yankees in the AL East, the Indians in the AL Central, Astros, I know guys, the Astros will win the AL West, there's just way too much talent on that team. Uh, Wild card, remember there are 16 playoff teams this year, so it looks a lot different. There are five wild card teams, I think that's going to be the Tampa Bay Rays, the Twins, the Athletics, the Rangers, and then the Angels finally with Mike Trout going to make it into the playoffs I think they've only been once which with having the best player in baseball is nuts to me but those are all my AL teams on the NL side I think the Braves win the NL East Nationals and the Phillies are all going to give them a run though that's probably going to be the most fun division in baseball to watch out of the NL Central I think the Cardinals take it no one in that division particularly impresses me but the Cardinals have experience they always seem to hang around and in a weird season I think that consistency is really going to help them out. So they take the NL Central, and then out in the West, it's the Dodgers. Again, just way too much talent. They just always seem to come up a little bit short when it comes to winning it all, despite the crazy amount of money they dump into that team. Uh, but the rest of the wild card teams, as you could expect, I think the Phillies and the Nationals both make it. And then uh, I see the Brewers, Rockies, and then the Reds. I think the Reds have a strong enough rotation where they're going to be able to sneak in this year. A nice young team that will produce within the next couple of years. They're going to be the beneficiaries, though, of the extended playoffs in 2020. So I'm not going to go matchup by matchup in the World Series. This is how I see it, guys. As much as the Yankees are loaded, I actually like the Tampa Bay Rays coming out here. They have a very young team. They're going to be able to hold up throughout this sprint. I like their rotation quite a bit. They've got good young bats in the lineup, and they're just one of those teams that They don't have any big-name bats in that lineup, but they have a lot of solid, consistent guys. And when you have a limited number of games, I think that's going to be huge. You don't have to worry about players getting streaky, hot and cold. All those guys are going to be there. They're going to be consistent. So I like the Rays. And for a lot of the same reasons, I like the Braves out of the, the National League. The Braves, again, really young. They've got some legitimate stars there in uh, Ronald Acuna. Their rotation isn't the best, but they've got a solid bullpen behind it. And they've got some legitimate firepower coming out of that lineup. So give me the Rays and the Braves. 
And then I think with the Braves just having that much more star power in their lineup, they are going to take this. Give me the Braves in five. So please don't grill me on that. I'm not nearly as strong with baseball as I am with football. However, give me the Atlanta Braves, your World Series champions for 2020. When we come back, guys, going to start diving in to our wide receiver preview for this episode, we are looking into the NFC and AFC East. You are listening to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. We'll be right back. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back in to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. I am your host, BSP, Brandon Soderpenner. Last segment, we tackled our five burning fantasy questions for today's episode. And now we are going to go ahead and continue the wide receiver preview series. So last week, we tackled the NFC and AFC North. I had a lot of interesting wide receiver rooms up there. So now we're going to move over to the AFC, NFC East. Now, as we go through these guys, especially with wide receivers, I may miss some players. So if there's anybody that you need an opinion on or you want to hear a little bit more about, let me know. Like I said, as usual, you can find me uh, at GSMC underscore F football is the show's Twitter. And then my personal Twitter at LA machine one seven. That's La machine 17. Let me know. I'd be happy to take a deeper dive into someone that you think has potential to break out or someone that you're worried about taking a step back. Anyone that we're not covering, just let me know. I'd be happy to get to that for you guys. So the NFC East. Uh, Let's go ahead and start with the most crowded of the wide receiver rooms, and that's going to be the Dallas Cowboys. So the Dallas Cowboys made a little bit of a splash in the NFL draft by taking CeeDee Lamb with the 17th pick, which was something that not a lot of people were expecting. But on that same note, not a lot of people were expecting Lamb to still be available at that point. So the Cowboys decided to take the best player available approach and snagged Lamb. Now, people are worried now that there are too many mouths to feed in Dallas. You have Amari Cooper, who usually finishes as an outside number one guy. You have Michael Gallup, who really came on strong last year. And then, of course, you have CeeDee Lamb. Now, while that is a legitimate concern, one thing I don't think people realize is that even in his older age, Jason Witten was eating up a lot of targets in that offense. So he is now gone. Uh, He was signed with Las Vegas, and that frees up 83 targets. So they still targeted him 83 times last year, and this is an incredibly high-powered offense that's going to get a ton of snaps, a ton of plays. So I don't think that anyone's fantasy value is going to be particularly limited just because there are so many of them. There's plenty to go around here. So let's start off. With Amari Cooper, he's currently sitting at wide receiver 9, ADP in the late 20s. Uh, So the frustrating thing with Amari Cooper is that he really is a historically inconsistent player. Uh, He'll blow up some weeks, and it'll be awesome to have him in your lineup. And other weeks, he'll just completely disappear. There doesn't seem to be a lot of middle ground with him, which is confusing to me because he's not like a particularly potent field stretcher he doesn't he's not a one-trick pony he is an all-around solid wide receiver 
but for whatever reason, they're either just not utilizing him in the game plan or he just doesn't show up week to week. We saw this when he was still in Oakland, when it was Oakland, and it's still happening here in Dallas. Uh, so what you've got to look at with Amari Cooper and what's going to take people away from him a little bit is just his pro- his production from game to game, guys. He only put up wide receiver two or better numbers in 11 out of his 25 games so far in Dallas. So don't get me wrong, there is value in a player like that, but when you're drafting somebody as high as the ninth overall wide receiver, as a top 10 guy, I like him to have a little bit more consistency in that realm. Cooper is a true boom or bust guy. I know you you all have heard me talk about that a lot. But the huge upside with him is when he goes off, I mean, he really does go off. He's a guy that can win you games from week to week, but it's tough to consistently have him in the lineup. And it's not even really a matchup game with him either. He just tends to randomly just not show up to these games. It's not like he'll only produce against some of the the lower tier defenses. He'll show up in big games and then disappear in, you know, games that should be easy for him, like against Washington a couple of times. He just didn't really show up. So he's a very frustrating guy. He's an excellent best ball uh, player for sure. I like him there a lot. Uh, You've also got to look, while I think there's still going to be plenty of targets to go around, there is some competition with Gallup and Lamb. And if he's going to continue to be inconsistent, whether that's on him or whether that's on the coaching staff, I I can see him potentially getting written out of the game plan a little more to favor guys like Gallup and Lamb, who tend to be, at least Gallup to this point, has been a much more consistent receiver week in and week out. And then CeeDee Lamb has the potential to be a top-tier receiver in the league. That's why he went in the first round. So he does have a chance to maybe lose some targets to him if these inconsistency issues continue to crop up. So also in this wide receiver room, I just mentioned him, you've got Michael Gallup. Uh, He's currently sitting at wide receiver 30. His ADP is somewhere in the 70s. So he came on very strong last year in 2019, even with Amari Cooper in that offense. Uh, He had 1,100 yards, six touchdowns, and listen to this, guys. As the second wide receiver, he received 113 targets. This is why I'm not incredibly worried about these guys canceling each other out. Now, even if they were, even if for some reason Dak Prescott were to throw the ball less this year, which I see no reason why he would, the defense is not great, they're going to be behind in games, I don't think Gallup has a ton to worry about right away. I love CeeDee Lamb, and he will develop nicely. However, if you want to pick any skill position that's going to develop a little bit slower than others, it's it's wide receiver. It's relatively rare that we see a rookie wide receiver come out and have an immediate impact, especially in a case like this where you do have options like Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup, and he's not necessarily going to be forced right into the spotlight. I see no legitimate threat of regression from Michael Gallup either. It's not like he has a a crazy touchdown number or anything. He's being fed and he's taking advantage of his opportunities. So I fully expect to get him around the same number of targets this year, even with the new additions. And guys, I didn't even think about this. Randall Cobb is also gone. This is how much they threw the ball. Let me look here. So if you if you combine Randall Cobb and Jason Witten's touches, you've got 166 targets up for grabs from last year. So again, between Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, CeeDee Lamb, they're going to be able to take advantage of those guys. You've got real fantasy value in all three of these players. So I'm really high on Michael Gallup. People are split on him because of the arrival of C.D. Lamb, but I don't see Mike McCarthy utilizing Gallup in the lineup less just because he drafted C.D. Lamb. He has true talent there. He's going to utilize it. So I understand the initial hesitation on Gallup, but I think he's going to outperform his ADP this year, and he's going to be an excellent choice for you. Again, any of these offensive weapons that they're using in Dallas this year are going to be valuable because, one, it was already one of the best offenses in the league, but two, now, as that defense continues to to get worse, they're going to find themselves down in games, and they're going to have to start slinging the ball around more. So I love Michael Gallup here. And then, of course, C.D. Lamb. He's sitting about 10 spots lower than Michael Gallup right now. His ADP is in the 110s. There are still targets available for him, guys. Even if Gallup and Cooper maintain their targets, I cannot, you know, drive this home enough. 
He might need a year to really solidify his role and start coming around. But C.D. Lamb did, you know, leave this draft as a relatively NFL-ready wide receiver. He's got the hands. He has the route tree. He has the body for it. The one thing he doesn't have right now is speed. And speed is one of the the cheat codes that these wide receivers can use to be super productive in year one because it's something you can't teach and it's not something you can really develop over time. So they can kind of use that right out of the gate. He doesn't have super crazy burner speed, so I do think that's going to limit him slightly in year one as he develops and just adjusts to NFL defenses. So he will get there. I'm a little bit hesitant on drafting him this year because I'm not convinced he's going to be able to just come right out the gate. Uh, But if you can somehow snag him in the maybe the 130, 140s for ADP, he is a great upside pick there for you. So... Yeah, there you have it with the Cowboys, guys. I You've got three very draftable wide receivers. Again, Lamb is the only one I have some reservations on. Uh, again, Amari Cooper's inconsistent, but they're going to have plenty of opportunity for touches and plenty of opportunity to score with that offense. All right, so let's move from one of the more high-octane wide receiver rooms to maybe the worst in the league, or at least one of the worst. And that's going to be the New York Giants, guys. Let's Let's start off the elephant in the room here there is no solid number one option in New York and really I could say that for the Jets or the Giants but specifically with the Giants there's really nobody so right now their top ranked guy uh, is Darius Slayton he's sitting at wide receiver 38 his ADP is at exactly 100 right now so last year 48 receptions 48 targets eight touchdowns here's the issue that I have with that first off that's only catching 57% of his targets. We've seen Daniel Jones not be a very accurate quarterback in year one. That's something that can improve, but I'm not super confident that he's just going to be able to fix that right away. So Slayton, not incredibly efficient with the targets he was given. And then eight touchdowns off of 48 receptions, that's going to come back, guys. He is due for some serious touchdown regression. When you're talking about 84 targets, you could easily cut that in half for a a solid wide receiver so that's going to come back a little bit you've also got to consider with the production that Slayton did have that was with a slew of wide receiver injuries for New York last year those injuries I want to say almost every receiver on their roster had to miss some sort of significant amount of time including Slayton this room is just impossible to project And even if somebody emerges as a true wide receiver one on this team, you're then limited by Daniel Jones and by the use of Saquon Barkley. So overall, I'm just, I'm not thrilled about New York's situation whatsoever. And again, your number one guy, your number one prospect right now, potentially, caught 57% of his targets last season. That's not fantastic. Another guy I'm probably the highest on here highest being very you know arbitrary is Sterling Shepard uh, he's sitting about six spots lower his ADP is at 113 wide receiver 46 so he missed six games in 2019 he did still manage though even in just 10 games he got 83 targets three touchdowns that's a little bit more of a realistic number I don't see the the negative regression coming for him when he is healthy When he is healthy, and that's a big if, guys. He's missed a lot of time. He is a nice PPR player. He tends to attract targets quite a bit, right? For whatever reason, Daniel Jones likes going to him a lot, and he does more with his targets than Darius Slayton did, at least from a percentage standpoint, even though he didn't have the same number of touchdowns. If he can stay healthy, he'll be a solid option. He's not going to be an elite guy. He's had his opportunity to really break out and show that he's the number one player there in New York, and he just hasn't yet. So I think he might be the best prospect. I wouldn't be surprised if he finishes as the wide receiver one when all is said and done in New York. However, this is all contingent on him staying healthy, which, again, I'm not super confident in. And then you have Golden Tate. I did misspeak. He served a a four-game suspension last year, so not this year. He will be ready right off the rip. Uh, He's sitting four spots lower, about wide receiver 50. So he's a veteran, and he's still good enough to command targets. Unfortunately, I don't 
think he's going to get enough targets to be a legitimate fantasy value. All he's going to do is just start to to water down the other guys. Even when he is getting targeted, Golden Tate is at that point in his career where he's not a playmaker anymore. He's not going to take crazy advantage of the targets that he does receive. He's going to water down the rest of this room when he is on the field. Not to mention, guys, we still have Evan Ingram who needs to get targets, and we've got Saquon Barkley, as I mentioned, that needs to get targets. There is just so many hurdles that you have to get over when it comes to predicting this wide receiver room this year. I'm just not confident in taking any of these guys, and you know my opinions on Daniel Jones as well. He had some good fantasy games last season. A lot of that had to do with his legs. He had a couple games where he threw a few nice touchdowns, but he does not strike me as a consistent quarterback option. Couple that with three middling wide receivers and a run-heavy offense, and things are just not adding up for me for New York. So just in general, I am not touching Giants wide receivers whatsoever this year. All right, so moving on now to the Eagles. The Eagles actually have a couple of nice options here. Uh, First being, you've heard me talk about him a lot, and that's Jalen Rager. So let me start with this. Looking at the, the ADPs between the Giants and the Eagles, it's crazy to me how much more I like the Eagles, and they're actually lower on most people's list. So Darius Slayton, wide receiver 38, ADP 100 for the Giants, is their supposed number one guy. And then Jalen Rager, who I think has the potential to finish as a wide receiver two, is sitting right now at wide receiver 56 with an ADP of 177. And then even Deshaun Jackson, wide receiver 58, a couple spots lower than him. These are all guys right now that are going later than the Giants wide receivers, which is just astounding to me. So let me go ahead and start with Rager. So... ADP 177, incredibly undervalued. This guy is likely to be the number one receiver in the offense. He has a much clearer path to being the number one guy than anyone does in New York right now. Uh, Even if his development is slow, because like I mentioned, rookie wide receivers tend to take some time. He is going to be able to produce off of pure volume. It is very likely this guy is going to be number one, guys. So Alshon Jeffrey still on the pup list. And supposedly he wants out of Philadelphia. Deshaun Jackson is too old at this point to be a legit number one. Jalen Rager has a clear path here. So he'll get tons of volume. He's a speedster, so I think when he does actually make these catches, he's going to be able to make plays. I'm very excited about Rager coming into 2020. Like I said, we're not sure when Alshon Jeffrey's coming back. Supposedly, he will be the number one guy when he is back on the field. However, I I think Rager has a chance to really lock down that number one job while Jeffrey is still hurt. I can see him taking advantage of every target that he gets, and the Eagles are going to realize right away that they have a solid NFL-ready wide receiver already in Rager. So even when Jeffrey comes back, I think his role will be significantly limited. So I'm taking Rager way higher than 56. If you guys can get him here absolutely snag him. I think his ADP is going to rise as we get closer and closer to the draft. And as Alshon Jeffrey continues to not make a ton of progress in his injury recovery, he's going to skyrocket up a board. So if you're drafting anytime soon and you're still able to get Rager somewhere in the wide receiver fifties, absolutely grab this guy because he has wide receiver two upside in his first year. So going to the other side of the field. Now we have Deshaun Jackson who I think actually has a similar build to Jalen Rager. These are both speedsters. Uh, Deshaun Jackson, I think, is he's not as good with the contested catch as Rager is. I think Rager has very underrated hands. Uh, However, he's going a couple spots later, only a couple spots later than Jalen Rager, according to experts. And actually, his ADP is higher. So people are taking him before Jalen Rager in some instances, which I don't really understand. Um So as we look at it, like I mentioned, Rager, I think, is being developed into the Deshaun Jackson successor. He missed significant time last year. He only played three games in 2019. He's 33 years old, and he's recovering from a major injury. There's a lot of red flags surrounding Deshaun Jackson. However, if he's healthy, we know the Eagles like to use him, and we know he's going to have a legitimate role in this offense, even if it is just as a field stretcher. 
So at the beginning of the year, if him and Rager are both healthy, I think you can see a little bit of a split. The Eagles definitely want to move Jalen Rager along rather quickly, so the targets are still going to favor Rager. And again, Deshaun Jackson is a risk at this point to have another injury and to have to sit out again. I do like Deshaun as a best ball prospect. He's always been, again, keep going back to it, he's a boom or bust guy. He's he's touchdown dependent. You're not going to see him be as efficient with his targets as somebody like Jalen Rager. So he does have some value. He might have a, a good early season role. But again, injury risk is very real. So I'm really just reducing him to more of a best ball prospect, but a good one at that because he's always going to have opportunity to score in that offense. And now moving to Alshon Jeffrey, again, only a few spots lower than Deshaun Jackson. All of these guys are kind of grouped together. He's another one where his ADP is actually still higher than both of these guys, uh, but experts tend to think that uh, he's definitely a little bit lower on the wide receiver risk. And the question is just his health. He is and has been told that he is the number one receiver on this team if he is healthy week one. But that doesn't Nothing coming out of that camp is making me confident that he's going to be able to actually see the field in week one or really within the first few weeks of the season. On top of that, we all fell in love with Alshon Jeffrey when he was still in Chicago. He's putting up incredible numbers as a wide receiver. I think he had a couple years where he finished as the number six, number seven guy in the league. He was fantastic. However, since 2014, he hasn't been able to put up more than 850 yards in a season which not ideal for a, a wide receiver one at all. I think overall Rashawn Jeff- or Alshon Jeffrey is regressing, and I think the injuries are just going to speed that up more and more. He's over 30 years old. Like I mentioned, he's, he's already leaked out that he wants to get out of Philadelphia in favor of some place where he'll have more opportunity. The writing's on the wall here, guys. I'm avoiding Alshon Jeffrey. There's a solid chance that he may never see the field in Philadelphia this year. And I'm not confident that he's going to be able to produce right out the gate, even if he is traded somewhere else. So not big on him. Jalen Rager, again, an absolute steal right now at wide receiver 56, if you can get him. And last but not least is Washington, guys. It's another situation that's not incredibly ideal. Uh, So Terry McLaurin, the number one guy there, I do like him a lot. He's sitting at wide receiver 22, ADP somewhere in the 60s. He had a great rookie year last year, which should be noted even more because he had a horrible, horrible quarterback situation. Dwayne Haskins was never really given time to properly develop as a quarterback. You had Case Keenum in there for a minute. You had Colt McCoy start a game. It was just a mess. But still, 919 yards, 7 touchdowns, and 93 targets. So again, solid rookie campaign from Terry McLaurin. If you factor in the fact that Haskins is the starter now, he's likely to improve in year two now with Ron Rivera as his coach. I really see things starting to stabilize there in Washington quite a bit. So all signs are pointing for McLaurin to actually have a better sophomore campaign. There are some new weapons in Washington, but not nearly enough to take away from McLaurin. He is the clear number one guy. I can see easily 110-plus targets for him in 2020. The run game is suspect there in Washington as well, so I think they're going to be throwing the ball quite a bit. And again, they're trying to develop Haskins in a year where they're obviously not going to compete uh, for a playoff spot. So I can see him throwing quite a bit. He also does have built-in chemistry with Dwayne Haskins. Both of these guys attended Ohio State at the same time. So you've got that to consider as well. All signs really pointing for McLaurin to have a great 2020. Uh, A couple other receivers there. We have Steven Sims. He's sitting at wide receiver 84. He's only really mentioned because he did get four touchdowns off of 56 targets last year. He's probably going to be the number two guy. He's going to be their slot receiver. But he hasn't shown quite enough to be a consistent fantasy option. Four touchdowns is quite a bit for only 56 targets. He just hasn't really shown enough to break out quite yet. So I'm avoiding him. And then I'm also going to be avoiding Antonio Gandy-Golden. He was the rookie wide receiver uh, that they brought in this year. So the the Kelvin Harvin injury in Washington is going to open up the opportunity for Golden to step right in and be the wide receiver. But he needs some time to really develop. This is not a situation where he's going to receive enough volume to make up 
for his lack of polish at this point. Uh, he came from Liberty, which was a non-Power 5 school, and he just he needs time to really adjust to NFL competition before I'm comfortable taking him in any kind of a fantasy draft. So he's someone two, three years down the road we might be looking at as a solid option, but definitely not in 2020. And then, guys, uh, another thing taking away from these other two players, Antonio Gibson is probably going to ha- factor pretty heavily into the passing game. I know you guys are probably sick of me talking about him, but he is that good. He's listed as a running back, but he is an offensive weapon, and he will be utilized all over the field. So there you have it, guys. That is the NFC East. We're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, going to continue diving into wide receiver rooms as we take on the AFC East. So you are listening to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. We'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. I am your host, BSP Brandon Soderpenner. Last segment took a look at the wide receivers of the NFC East, and so now we're going to naturally transition here and give you the AFC East wide receiver rooms. Before we get into this, make sure you're also tuning in next week as we will move on to the NFC and AFC South wide receiver rooms. A lot of great options there, of course, being... Uh, Michael Thomas for the Saints and Julio Jones for the Falcons. Going to be a lot of fun diving into those guys. After that, AFC, NFC West, and then my top 30 wide receiver rankings will be coming in the episode following. So, again, very excited. A lot of great content for you guys moving forward here. So let's get into the AFC East, guys. I'm going to start off with the Miami Dolphins. So the number one guy finally had the breakout year we've been waiting for from him for what feels like forever, and that's Devontae Parker. Now, he's still, for some reason, sitting at wide receiver 24. His ADP is somewhere in the 60s. So now this guy, this is the crazy thing. Most guys, when they have their breakout year, it's usually because of some great quarterback play as well, but that wasn't the case with Parker. He had some very inconsistent quarterbacks last year with Josh Rosen and then uh, Fitzpatrick for the majority of the year. Still able to get himself 128 targets and 9 touchdowns off those scores, 1,202 yards. So what we did notice last year is he developed a solid chemistry with Fitzpatrick. While Parker is somewhat limited as a wide receiver as far as being able to get real separation, Fitzpatrick actually helps him out a lot because... More than anyone, other than maybe Phillip Rivers, he's not afraid to sling the ball into coverage. And Devontae Parker was able to take advantage of that quite a bit this year. As long as Fitzpatrick is the starter, he's going to continue to produce as a low-end wide receiver one. The other thing he has going for him this year, with COVID stalling everything out and limiting the amount of training camp and off-season activities that teams are able to have, I think that's really going to slow Tua Tungavailoa's path to the starting job. I don't think they're going to want to throw him out there right away, especially recover, recovering from a major injury like he is. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't necessarily see Tua at all this year, 
or or at the at the most, maybe he gets a couple games at the end of the season. So again, Fitzpatrick's going to maintain that starting job. That's going to help Devontae Parker a lot. Like I said, that aggressiveness from Fitzpatrick is going to play well into what Devontae Parker is able to produce as a wide receiver. So in my opinion, guys, he's a low-end wide receiver one, which at an ADP in the 60s is absolutely crazy, right? He is He's very undervalued right now. He's another guy who I think is going to continue to climb up the ranks. People are nervous about him, again, because of that quarterback situation in Miami and because of the poor offensive line. But I don't really see a situation where the offense is any worse in 2020. If anything, they should take a slight step forward. So, again, to me, he's a low-end wide receiver one, and he has a high floor. He's definitely higher than wide receiver 24. Even if things don't go incredibly well, I think at worst, he finishes somewhere between 15 and 17. He's a very, very good fantasy prospect this year, and he is criminally undervalued right now. Also in that wide receiver room, we do have Preston Williams. He's currently sitting at the wide receiver 49. His ADP is up in the 130s. Now, he didn't play in eight games in 2020, a lot of that due to injury, and some of it was just earning the starting job to begin with. He was an undrafted free agent, and he did show enough last year that he should be the number two guy up there in Miami. Now, the first time we've seen him play was last year. We do need to see if he can stay healthy. Again, missed pretty significant time, but when he was on the field, he flashed very well for a guy who was, you know, undrafted. He had three touchdowns, 428 yards. There are going to be targets there for him. There's not a lot of real competition for targets right now in Miami, but again, the question is going to be injury. It was pretty major. He had an ACL tear, so you're always going to have a question mark when it comes to that kind of recovery. And this was his very first NFL season. So there, we just need to know how he's going to bounce back. And we need to know if this is going to be a consistent issue for him before he becomes a real solid fantasy option. So a decent flyer option for you. Again, just from pure volume, he should be able to produce relatively well from a fantasy perspective. Only other two names of note in Miami are Albert Wilson and Alan Hearns. While they will get some starting time, I think they're going to just be non-factors from a fantasy standpoint in 2020. There's just no truly defined role for either of those guys, so just avoiding them in general. Uh, But the big takeaway from Miami, snag Devontae Parker where you can because, I mean, ADP 63, he's going in rounds four or five. He's going to way outproduce that for sure. Uh, So now moving to the New England Patriots, this was an interesting one to kind of dive into. And you all know my opinions on Mohamed Sanu specifically in this offense, who everyone else seems to be low on. So let, let's start diving into it. Right now, the number one projected option is still Julian Edelman. He's sitting at about wide receiver 33. I do expect a decent amount of regression from him this year. He's 34 years old, and we've only seen him produce with Tom Brady there. We know he was a favorite target of Tom Brady, and we know the system was schemed to be able to really get him open. But now with Cam Newton, it's going to take some time for a new favorite guy to emerge. Julian Edelman does not strike me as the type of player that's going to be able to win with just his talent. He has to be schemed to be able to get open, and I just don't know if he's going to have that same kind of chemistry with Cam Newton that's going to utilize him in the offense nearly as well. On top of that, guys, the the Patriots are going to be a lot more run-heavy this year. They know what kind of quarterback Cam Newton is. He's still going to try to make plays with his feet. Um, And then again, man, Julian Edelman, 34, 34 guys. He was already playing through some injuries last year. It's going to end up catching up to him. I'm just not huge on Edelman at all in 2020. Uh, So now moving on, you've got Nikhil Harry, who's a supposed second option right now. He's sitting at wide receiver 59. His ADP is in the 140s. He did have some pretty slow regression his rookie season. Not entirely surprising in that New England offense. They tend to rely on their veterans a lot more than their younger guys. He does have some great big play ability, which is why the Patriots took him in the first round a couple years ago now. And that's going to mesh well with a guy like Cam Newton. Cam Newton is going to make plays with his feet. He's going to extend plays. And when these plays start to break down, that's where I think Nikhil Harry is going to start to have some value. He is not the greatest route runner in the world, but he has all the physical traits that you want from a wide receiver that are going to allow him to really start to break things open the longer plays go on. 
The other issue with Nikhil Harry, though, he did miss nine games due to injury. That definitely, you know, hurt his progression, as I had mentioned. So all of these things taken into account, he's not yet a solid starter. He's going to be utilized in that offense, but we just need to see him stay on the field, and we need to see him progress a little bit more before I'm comfortable taking him as a regular fantasy option. And then the guy I'm a little bit higher on, guys, it's Mohamed Sanu. He's wide receiver 80. His ADP is 252. So this is a guy that's basically going undrafted right now. He's going to greatly outperform that ADP. I'm not completely sure why everyone is so low on Mohamed Sanu. Didn't do a lot last year. However, veteran receiver, he's going to be able to produce right away. He's had a year in that offense now, and as Cam Newton looks to find a new favorite guy, Sanu has more ability than Julian Edelman, and he has more experience than Nikhil Harry. So I would not be surprised if he emerges as the number one receiver in this offense right away. He's only 30 years old, guys. People seem to think Mohamed Sanu is ancient right now. He's younger than Julian Edelman by quite a bit. He has plenty of play left in him. And also, yes, he did not produce very well when he was in New England last year. He missed, uh, sorry, he didn't miss any time. But he did play through a significant amount of injury, so he should be back this year stronger. He shouldn't have to worry about that. And he's also a guy that's not going to miss time. He's only missed three games in his entire career. This is a guy that's been in the league for nine seasons, and he's only missed three games. So all of these things added up. Mohamed Sanu is an excellent late-round flyer for you. For a guy that has a clear shot at being the number one receiver in this offense, be it a run-heavy offense, is still going to have great value for you. So there's that's my take on the whole thing. Edelman, I think, will take a big step back. Nikhil Harry needs a little bit more time. And because of that, Mohamed Sanu, I think, has an excellent shot at being the wide receiver one in New England. So next up, guys, we have Buffalo. It's another guy that you've heard me talk about quite a bit. Uh, that's their number one receiver right now in Stephon Diggs. He's sitting at wide receiver 27. His ADP is in the mid-50s. As you've heard me talk about before, he is a great deep threat. However, and surprising to some, that's not necessarily great with Josh Allen as your quarterback. Josh Allen, while he has an excellent arm, his numbers throwing down the field are awful, and he has not really been able to utilize hitting his receivers way downfield, which is where Diggs is going to get you the majority of his production. Also got a factor in this team is going to be run heavy. They have Singletary. They drafted Zach Moss as well. They have a solid offensive line, and they're also more than likely not going to have to be throwing the ball a ton because that defense is also going to be excellent. It's a very balanced team. They're going to go to the run a lot, and with Stephon Diggs already being a guy that's a little bit limited from a target standpoint because of how he plays, that's just going to hurt him even more. He's not high volume. He's very touchdown dependent, and at best, guys, even if everything goes his way, I think his ceiling is a a low-end wide receiver, too. He's got big bust potential this year, kind of like we saw with guys like Juju Smith-Schuster last year. I I think he could really burn a lot of people and not be utilized in that offense the way that people think. As I look at the room more and more with players like John Brown and Cole Beasley there— I can see all of these guys finishing with very similar target numbers. So I am fading Stefan Diggs pretty hard this year. Moving on now, we got John Brown as the wide receiver two. It's actually a kind of a similar to Steph- uh, player to Stefan Diggs, but he has a little bit more of the, the intermediate routes that Josh Allen could take advantage of. He's sitting at wide receiver 37. Last year, 115 targets, got himself 1,000 yards and six touchdowns. Now, Diggs might bite into this total a little bit because they play somewhat of a, a similar role. However, I think, they're like I said, their targets are going to be pretty close together as the year goes on, especially since Stephon Diggs, among all the other things I've already said, is going to have to acclimate to that offense, and he's not really going to have any time to, to do it in 2020, in the offseason, rather. Um, so all that being said, I'm not sold on Brown either because these all these guys are going to eat away at each other a little bit. He's going to lose some of the consistency that he had in 2019. I do like him as a best ball option, as I do with Stephon Diggs, but neither of these guys are going to be consistent standard fantasy players this year. I'm not really big on either of them. 
Uh, and then we've got Cole Beasley. He's the slot guy. He's sitting at wide receiver 78. Uh, his ADP is all the way up in the 250s. And of all the players on this team, I think Beasley actually has the best chance to outperform his ADP pretty significantly, even with Diggs here. He, for, for starters, he plays out of the slot, so he's not going to be in crazy competition with either Brown or Stephon Diggs. And last year, as the slot guy, got 106 targets. I don't see that total changing a whole lot, guys. He, he's very similar to Danny Amendola, who I mentioned uh, last episode when I was talking about the Detroit Lions. He's going to be excellent in PPR because he's going to be targeted quite a bit. He'll take advantage of those. He's not going to get you a ton of touchdowns. That's not the player he is. That's not how they utilize him in the offense. But he's a great wide receiver three or flex option, especially in PPR. And at again, wide receiver almost 80, he's going undrafted. So if you don't want to take a lottery ticket type pick, with one of your later rounds, you want a guy that you know is going to be able to get you relative consistent value, then I'm definitely targeting a guy like Cole Beasley in those very late rounds. So I like him a lot, not nearly as big on the other wide receivers currently in that room. And finally, as I mentioned, there is not a solid number one guy in New York. I meant that for the Giants. I still mean that for the Jets. Their number one guy right now is Jamison Crowder. He is sitting at wide receiver 45. So just in in general, guys, as a rule of thumb, I'm not confident in this Jets offense. However, he is going to be their wide receiver one. He already has some rapport with Sam Darnold. You've got a couple of younger guys coming in that he's going to be competing with. But like I said, that chemistry is going to help him out right away. He should be able to pretty easily fend off Brashad Perriman and Denzel Mims for targets. So last year, even in that woeful Jets offense, he was able to get 122 targets, good for 833 yards, six touchdowns. I think he might regress slightly with his touchdown total. It's a, a little bit high for how he was utilized. Uh, however, the other numbers... Not super impressive for a wide receiver one. 833 yards on 122 targets is not incredibly efficient. So even given that he keeps his current role in that offense, doesn't have a particularly high floor, and I don't see him you know, being a world beater. He is a, a nice lid, a mid to late round option for you that's going to be able to get you points week in and week out, but he's not going to be blowing the doors off of anybody for sure. Uh, another guy a lot of people think is the, the favorite to take over as the wide receiver one there in New York is Rashad Perriman. He's sitting about 10 wide receiver rankings below Jamison Crowder right now. He has the talent. Everyone keeps saying that Rashad Perriman has the talent to be a solid NFL wide receiver, but he just can't seem to stick anywhere. This is his fourth NFL team already. He was solid in Tampa Bay last year, but what you have to remember is that Tampa Bay threw the ball a ton you had Jameis Winston somehow finish as the the passing leader and also throw 30 interceptions. Like It was just a very abnormal kind of season. He also had two top five wide receivers in Chris Godwin and Mike Evans from a fantasy perspective last year, which, again, is just nuts. So I don't see Brashad Perriman necessarily being able to translate that. I think he was the product of a very pass-happy offense. And people see those numbers from last year, and they assume that that's why he's going to be able to just step in and be able to perform well in New York. But, man, it's just – I don't see it. He's going to be due for some real regression with Sam Darnold, And on top of that, way more so than Jamison Crowder, who has that chemistry already with Darnold, I think that Perriman is going to be legitimately competing for targets with Denzel Mims. So moving on then to Mims – He's sitting at wide receiver 68. His ADP is almost in the 200s. So the real competition here, as I mentioned, is going to be for that wide receiver two spot. Robbie Anderson is gone. It's up for grabs. And again, most people think that Perriman can take that over and even move up into a wide receiver one. But Mims, he's a bigger receiver. I think he's going to be a nice safety valve type target. And I think that gives him immediate advantage over somebody like Brashad Perriman. I can see him and Darnold really, you know, clicking right away and him becoming a favorite target as Darnold, you know, is struggling to keep his job. He's going to be more likely to throw it to someone with a better catch radius that can bring these targets down, improve his numbers a little bit, 
then he would be with someone like Brashad Perriman, who's going to make you know most of his plays off of just pure speed. So he's a strong candidate, I think, to outperform his ADP. It's going to be hard not to, being all the way in the 200s right now. The only person really in his way is Brashad Perriman, and I'm just not nearly as sold on Perriman as everyone else seems to be. He's had one good year in an offense that threw the ball at a historic rate. So really look for Denzel Mims, especially as the the year goes on, to take over that wide receiver two spot and be behind Jamison Crowder. Even though I do believe he's going to outperform his ADP, he's still not a great option. He's more of a a late round guy that you're going to want to grab. However, when your buddies are grabbing Brashad Perriman over him, you're going to be able to get a guy who's likely to overtake his job within a few weeks uh, with Denzel Mims. So I like Mims. That's really it. The rest of that offense I'm not crazy about at all. So one thing I've noticed today, man, every other team seems to have either an amazing wide receiver room or a really crappy one when we're talking about all of these East teams. So there you have it, guys. Like I said, next week I will start diving into the wide receivers of the AFC and NFC South. Julio Jones and Michael Thomas, that's going to be a ton of fun. When we come back, guys, we're going to wrap up the show. Last week, remember, I gave you my top 10 fantasy prospects over the age of 30. We're going to flip that all around. I will give you my top 10 fantasy prospects under the age of 25, guys that are going to be awesome dynasty value and are going to be able to produce despite the fact that they're still fresh into the league. You are listening to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. We'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. I am your host, BSP, Brandon Soderpenner. Covered a lot today for you guys. Answered your five burning fantasy questions and then took a look at the NFC and AFC North wide receiver rooms. So here it is. We're at the end of the show and you know what that means. It is time for my top 10. So today, the top 10 fantasy players under the age of 25. These are guys that are going to produce for you, despite still being pretty fresh into the league. These are excellent dynasty picks and excellent standard and PPR picks as well. There's a lot of excellent young talent in the NFL, especially in 2020. So let's go ahead and dive right into that. So starting at number 10, it's actually the youngest player on this list at just 22 years old, and that is DK Metcalf, the wide receiver for the Seahawks. You guys know why I'm excited about Metcalf. He is a physical freak that fell down a lot of people's boards because he didn't have the best combine performance when it came to some of the agility drills, but he has proven that he can win off of pure athleticism and his speed. This guy is going to go up and get 50-50 balls, and for him, it's not 50-50. It's 70-30. Metcalf is going to be a legitimate playmaker here for years to come, and I think in 2020, this is going to be the the first year, just his second year in the league, he will take that number one wide receiver spot in Seattle, which we have seen year after year is incredibly valuable from a fantasy perspective. To be Russell Wilson's number one target means you are going to have fantasy relevance as long as you are on that field. So DK Metcalf, an easy number 10 for me. 
Number nine also shouldn't be surprising. 23 years old. That's Lamar Jackson, the quarterback for Baltimore. The only reason he is not higher on this list is because there is still some risk for injury. We have to see how he holds up year after year. But just the the ability that he's shown in his two years in the NFL, the guy is just, he's built different. He is the definition of a dual threat quarterback and will make you pay no matter how you try to defend him. So as long as he is staying healthy and on the field, Lamar Jackson is going to be a top three fantasy quarterback for you. And speaking of top tier fantasy quarterbacks, number eight, Patrick Mahomes. Like Jackson, he does already have an NFL MVP and unlike Jackson, has already won a Super Bowl. Guys, we cannot take away how impressive this was for him. Just his second year starting full-time, that defense was absolutely atrocious. It was one of the worst defenses to win a Super Bowl ever. And this guy put the team on his back and was able to, to win it for him against a very good 49ers team and one of the best defenses in the NFL. So Patrick Mahomes has already shown he's not afraid of the spotlight. I think he's the best passer in the league right now. You can't compare to Lamar Jackson's legs, but if you're looking for just a pure thrower of the football, it's Mahomes. He has had one injury that he missed a couple of uh, games because of, but he came back way quicker than anybody expected. So the dude's durable. And because of that, and because of the fact that he already has won a Super Bowl, that puts him just a little bit above Lamar Jackson, even from a fantasy perspective, as uh, my number eight player under the age of 25. Number seven, now moving into non-quarterbacks, that's going to be Mark Andrews, the, the tight end for Baltimore. This dude is the top receiving target in a very potent Ravens offense. Now, the Ravens like to run the ball, we know that, but Andrews has already made himself a favorite of Lamar Jackson, and since, again, Jackson's 23, Andrews is 24, I don't see these two breaking up anytime soon. He's a good safety valve for starters, for Jackson, but then he's got the ability to make plays down the field as well. And don't forget too, guys, Mark Andrews was not just handed this. This was not a situation where no matter who the tight end is in this offense they're going to produce, he was behind Hayden Hurst. Hayden Hurst was a first-round pick. I think Mark Andrews went in the fourth or fifth round after him. He worked his way up to this role, and I don't see him giving it up now anytime soon. He's proven that it's his ability that makes him productive, not the system itself. So I love Mark Andrews. He's going to be around for quite a while. Uh, the best young tight end in the league for sure. You got Travis Kelsey. He's getting up there in age a little bit. Um, Greg Kittle is younger. But if you're looking for guys that are going to be able to dominate the league for the longest period of time, I think it's Mark Andrews. He's got a whole career ahead of him still. Uh, number six, man, if this guy would just commit to his contract, I think he would be going as a top five running back right now. That's Dalvin Cook. He's 24 years old. He's trying to get that second running back contract, which I completely understand because of running running backs just criminally underpaid in this league. But uh, when he's on the field, he's absolutely electric. He had some injury issues, especially early in his career. Lately, he's been able to stay on the field and, and play healthy. And when he is, the dude's a, a human joystick. He is so much fun to watch. He's not going to overpower everyone, but he doesn't need to. He wins with speed, he wins with agility, and he's going to make you miss in the open field. Plus, he's going to get a ton of volume as long as he's still in Minnesota. So assuming that they can come to some sort of consensus on the contract, we know Minnesota's going to want to run the ball, and Cook is going to be the beneficiary of that. And you can use him out of the passing game as well. So he's a legitimate offensive weapon all over the place, but he will have a ton of volume if he could just sign his contract and get on the field. Uh, another player here, number five, another running back, tied for the youngest on this list, which is why I've got him just a little bit above Dalvin Cook, and that's Josh Jacobs. Now, Josh Jacobs is not going to be a factor in the r passing game, right? He's not going to be utilized like that, but he's the definition of a workhorse. Guys we used to see like Arian Foster, even Adrian Peterson when he was more healthy, you're just going to feed him the ball over and over again, and he's going to get you five, six yards every time. I love Josh Jacobs. He's behind a very underrated offensive line. And the reason he's above Dalvin Cook on this list is because I know Josh Jacobs is going to play this year. I know Josh Jacobs is going to play for the next two or three years. He's He was a rookie in 2019. So he's got plenty of field ahead of him before that, that second contract really starts to come up, and he's going to be old reliable this year. So I'm very high on Josh Jacobs, my number five player under 25. Number four, getting into the really elite guys here that are 
all now going to be borderline, if not solid first round picks. Uh, so Chris Godwin, you guys know I'm very high on him this year. He's uh, 24 years old, the slot receiver for Tampa Bay. People are concerned about him and Evans now as to who you need to draft where. Godwin, I think, is the better player for starters. And then now with Tom Brady there, instead of Jameis Winston, I think it's going to help him out even more. Tom Brady has always been a fan of going to his slot receivers. We saw it with Wes Welker, with Julian Edelman. We see this year in and year out, and now he's got Godwin, who might be the best slot receiver in the league. He's going to go to him early and often. That's going to hurt Mike Evans' fantasy value. It's going to shoot Godwin's way up. So I like Godwin to finish as a top five wide receiver this year. So my number four player under 25 and the best wide receiver under the age of 25 from a fantasy perspective this year. And I don't think it's really close. Uh, number three, we got three running backs around this off, guys. Spoiler alert. I'm sure you can figure out who they are. Number three, Joe Mixon, just 24 years old, guys. And he's going to be in for a very solid year from a volume perspective. And we've only seen him get better as a running back year in and year out. Now that there's other offensive weapons that – defenses are going to have to focus on and a legitimate quarterback that defenses have to focus on that's only going to push this development even further and this is the year he's really going to establish himself as an elite running back not only from a fantasy perspective but from a full league perspective Mixon is going to put everyone on notice here in 2020 look out for him to finish as a top five running back I'm going to have a lot of Joe Mixon this year if I'm able to get my hands on him number two Again, last two guys should not be surprising. Saquon Barkley, running back, New York Giants, just 23 years old. They drafted him to build an offense around. Saquon Barkley is going to have a carved-out role in that offense as long as he wants to hang around. The Giants know that Daniel Jones is not going to go out there and win them games on his own quite yet. So Barkley is going to be the focal point. This dude's a physical freak. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He had some lingering ish injury issues last year, but assuming he can fend those off and continue to play through, he is always going to be an excellent fantasy target for you. And then number one, guys, even though he's not my top fantasy player for 2020, Christian McCaffrey is the best under the age of 25. He's only 24 years old. He's got his second contract. He's going to be there in Carolina for the long run now. And man, when he's on the field, he is a fantasy freak. He is the best fantasy prospect we have seen in years. The only reason I had any hesitation on McCaffrey is the team is tanking this year in general, and I think he's going to be pulled off the field a decent amount because of that. But my God, guys, Christian McCaffrey speaks for himself. He's a running back. He's a wide receiver. He is just an offensive weapon. And from a fantasy perspective, that's nuts. They're going to use him all over the field, and he's going to rack up fantasy points for you week in and week out. So... Not even a question. Christian McCaffrey, the best fantasy player under the age of 25. So that is going to do it for today, guys. So next episode, uh, make sure you, you tune in and listen. We're going to take a look at the wide receivers of the NFC and AFC South. Got a lot of great talent down there. You've got Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, uh, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans. It's going to be absolutely loaded. Remember, guys. Follow the show on Twitter. Ask your fantasy questions here. You can find me at GSMC underscore F football. And then my Twitter is at LA machine one seven La machine 17. So thank you for listening to the GSMC fantasy football podcast brought to you by the GSMC podcast network. I'd like to ask you guys, please remember to subscribe to the show, write a nice review for us. That always helps. You can find us on Stitcher. You can find us on Apple podcasts. You can find us pretty much anywhere that you can get your podcast. Any feedback is always awesome, positive or negative. Would love to know how we can improve the show for you guys. Also, follow us on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We are on all social media platforms. So, again, thank you guys. It's been a lot of fun. You all enjoy the rest of your day, and take it easy. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.